My name is Skipper Chong Warson, and I'm a design director in San Francisco. And you're listening to How This Works. This is a show where I invite people on to talk about those things that they know very well. And Thijas Chakravarti is with me to talk about a bunch of things, but mainly about how we manifest change, both from a point of view of learning or work, as well as in our personal lives. I think these are all important topics, especially right now. I appreciate you making time, Thijas. Oh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So we like to start the show by hearing from our guest. So I want to hear from you. Will you tell us some things? Who are you? Where did you grow up? Okay, uh, let's see if I can do this justice. Um, <laughs> so I was born in India, uh, specifically in Mumbai. Okay. Uh, according to apocryphal stories from family, I crowned in the cab okay. on the way to the hospital. So that's okay. pretty funny. Uh, my father was a Brahmin, a uh, very Orthodox Hindu family. My mother was Catholic, the opposite. And so because of that, uh, we weren't exactly welcome in the motherland. So my parents decided to jaunt off to Bahrain. Okay. Um, so, we, so we lived for a little bit in Bahrain, um, and then we would go back and visit family pretty regularly. But then eventually my family, uh, my mom and my dad decided that uh, we were going to go to America for, you know, the opportunities in the new world. Sure. Um, so my parents came over first, uh, and while they were putting the money together for me and my sister, we ended up in, a boarding, in boarding schools. And so, uh, I, I mean, I'm mentioning all of this because I kind of have a like deep-seated confusion about tradition and the way things are because, <laughs> well, I mean, I never really got exposed to any of that stuff growing up. Sure. So I have no, I have no mental concept of what that means. That makes sense. But my family uh, settled in Baltimore. Okay. Bodymore, Murderland. Um, when I got here, I was still in middle school, um, which is a fun time to have an <laughs> accent and not understand how things work. <laughs> and so that was pretty much the case through middle school and then through high school. Okay. And that was, eh, I wouldn't say that was fun. I wouldn't necessarily say it wasn't a learning experience, but it wasn't fun. So uh, then I got into college, um, and that's when I started figuring out a little bit more stuff about how to fit in and, you know, how it's kind of okay not to fit in in certain places and okay. sort of coming to grips with that sort of thing. Okay. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's my path. And where are you located now? Oh, right now I'm in New York City. Okay. And uh, I've lived here for about five years, I think-ish. I, I love that while you're saying this, and I hope this makes it into the show via edits, I can hear a siren in the background. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. No, there's so many edits. That's right. <laughs> the sounds of the city. So what's one thing, they just about you that people might not guess? Something, of course, that you feel comfortable sharing? Ah, well, um, so I thought about this uh pretty long and hard uh, when you mentioned that uh, you'd be asking me this question. I have an almost pathological fear of dislocating my right shoulder. Huh. So the first time I did it was after my second show ever with a hardcore band that I was in called Lovers and Killers. Okay. And I was still kind of running off the adrenaline of playing like my second show ever. And, <laughs> but I was still tense. So I was stretching and I don't know how it happened, but I rolled my shoulder in just the right angle to dislocate my right shoulder. Okay. But again full of adrenaline. I just admittedly like a dummy, I just reset it myself. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then went on to like finish loading out the van and loading up, packing everything up and then spend the rest of the show going, ah, my shoulder feels a little funny, but no big deal. Okay. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't use it the next day. I just couldn't even, I couldn't raise it. It was weird. But then uh, pretty much every month since that incident, I, I redislocated it for almost a year. Like almost every month it would just like pop out of socket and I'd have to pop it back in. <laughs> then once I started paying attention to what I was doing, it didn't dislocate as often because I was very careful about where I was moving my arm and what plane of motion, stuff like that. Okay. And then I dislocated it throwing a snowball. <laughs> um, and then I freaked out again and started focusing again, sort of being really attentive to how I was moving my arms and where I was doing stuff. And okay. then... Uh, I dislocated again, uh, picking up an empty plastic bottle that was over my right shoulder. So I'm constantly aware of where my right shoulder is and how I'm moving my right arm because I just, I, I, the idea of dislocating again just horrifies me. It's, it's, it's something that I just, I, I can't get past. Okay. Uh, that is, that is not something that I would have guessed about you for as, as many years as we've known each other. Yeah, I am super, super concerned about my, about my shoulder. <laughs> so, Thijas, what are we talking about today? What's the subject matter in which you consider yourself very knowledgeable? 
Well, um, as I said, when you mentioned uh, that you wanted uh, me to be on your podcast, which again, thank you, um, I was, I was, and still am, extremely surprised um, because uh, I guess it's it's hard for me to accept that I actually know anything because I kind of, you know, kind of start from the uh, from the starting point of well, I'm only fifty percent sure I'm not a brain hallucinating vividly in a jar, <laughs> so like to be sure of something is kind of a. Ugh. But um, I think the thing that I know the most about is probably the way that people think and the way that people work within the workplace. And okay. so like how we think about work, how we think at work, how we act, um, what we can do to make workspaces that actually result in the behaviors that we want to see okay. um, as opposed to the behaviors that we do see. So mm -hmm. it's questions around things like, well, how do you reduce nepotism how do you reduce ageism in hiring well nepotism is kind of easy you just don't hire somebody who's related to somebody else and you do a you know you basically verify that somebody's not related to somebody in the company but what about <laughs> sure well with ageism you kind of need to have policies in place that say well if somebody gives you a resume and it's got like their birth date because there are some some people who still do that or you know the year they graduated college or the year they graduated they finished their masters sure. well just scrub out the dates sure. just scrub out the dates and now you don't know how old this person is right and that's what i mean there's, there's challenges in the workplace but it's something that i kind of know a bit more about than most of the other things i know about i mean i recently started a company by recently i mean about a year and a year and change now at this point okay where Basically, I have a business where I help companies work more efficiently and so more smoothly. And the two and the clients that I've had so far have been very positive in their feedback, which okay. you know I guess they kind of have to be because they paid for me. So oh, I don't, think, I don't think I don't think they have right? to be, but uh, that's fair. That's right, fair. Right. They, could, they could just be. But I, I think I think that's the one topic I feel like I'm not a complete neophyte at. Okay, take me back to. Like, how did you first become interested in this idea of how helping companies to be better? Like, where is the beginning of this? Well, David Copperfield. Yeah, I was. No, no. <laughs> um, so it was actually probably in college. Okay. So I was one of those college students who didn't actually want to go to college. But my mom and dad were kind of adamant that, hey, we're immigrants. What the hell are you doing? Go to, go to college. Sure. And, you know, that's what you're going to do. Um, I definitely didn't want to go. I had no idea what to study. I had no idea what I even cared about. Um, so my first, I want to say, three years of college, I was undeclared. Um, I know you're not supposed to be able to do that, but uh, I think my advisor dropped the ball a little bit. I mean, he picked it up real fast once he realized <laughs> what I'd done. But, like, uh, I, I just took a bunch of psychology classes because I love I loved the field. I love it so much. Okay. And, I, uh, I mean, I took dance classes. I took piano classes. I did. Okay. I was taking enough psychology classes that I basically was just a hop, skip, and a jump away from becoming a counselor. Okay. And so I said, oh, great. Then all I got to do is take this counseling class. And during my first practice session, the teacher kind of pulled me aside and she said, your problem is you aren't separating yourself enough from this client. Oh. And you need to learn to stop trying to solve the problem for them. They have to solve it themselves. Right. Which she was 100% right. That's a totally fair assessment. But to be fair... Um, I was a young male who didn't want to be in college at all, so I kind of took it as a direct assault on my personhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was, so I kind of, I kind of took a step back from that. And I was like, well, maybe counseling isn't for me because the idea of listening to somebody pour out their heart and explain their problems, and not being able to say, oh my god, let's let's find a way to solve this problem for you because it sounds like a real problem. Yeah. So tell me more about how you feel as opposed to, dude, maybe you should stop smoking meth. <laughs> Kind of how my head worked. Right. Um, so, of course, I left. Uh, so after I had that little interaction, she was a great teacher. I, I learned so much from her. And so after that situation, I kind of took a couple steps back and I said, okay, wait. If what I really care about is solving problems, mm. well, what's the easiest – or rather, what's the biggest problem a lot of people run into? Like what's the number one thing that makes people unhappy? Yeah. I was working, I was working at a bookstore at the time. So, of course, you know, after classes ended, I went, you know, went to go work my shift. Sure. And I remember st sitting at work, just kind of you know, selling books, which I liked. It was a great job. I still kind of enjoy bookstores. But I, it dawned on me. It was like, well, you know, the number one thing people hate is work. Mm. Like, they hate their jobs. Almost everybody hates their job. <laughs> and the few people who say, oh, my God, I love my job, well, they don't love all of it. And sometimes the things that they hate about their job are just their aspects of the job that 
people should be able to control yeah. because in the end of it, like work is a controlled environment. It's a constructed environment. Sure. There's no reason to assume that we need to work nine to five. Yeah. However, that contract was put in place uh, by the Ford Motor Company right. um, because they wanted to create a 40 hour, a five day, 40 hour work week. Right. But why did Ford even come up with a five day, 40 hour work week? Well, a 40 hour work week with eight hour shifts, he could have 24 hours of coverage if he had three, eight hour shifts. That makes sense. But he wanted a weekend not because he felt like his employees were wonderful and he wanted to give them the chance to, you know, really spread their wings and be wonderfully well actual. No, 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 nothing like that. He just wanted their money. Mm. The money that he was paying them, he wanted them to be able to spend. So he said, cool, 40 hours a week it is. And yeah. that's it. That's the only reason. Yeah. But like once I realized that, I said, okay, wait, so there has to be something in psychology that – which I love as a field that yeah. will let me tackle this problem. It turns out there is, there's an entire field of psychology called industrial organizational psychology. So I did that, <laughs> that ended up being my, my, my undergraduate. Okay. And then after I was done with that, one of my professors actually suggested that I try the instructional systems design master's program, mm, okay. which again, surprising to me because I, I mean, I, I, I didn't even think I was that good of a student, but she pointed out that one of the major issues in industrial organizational psychology is well, how do you get people to change? Like yeah. you can understand the problem. You can have a better, deeper understanding of the systems that are causing these issues. Sure. But then how do you cause behavioral change? Sure. And so I said, well, then, then why not? Why don't I just fucking focus on this thing? Yeah. She, like, again, 100% right. I, yeah. I've never never been happier to be, uh, to be steered. So I'd say after that, it's just been – you know, get the inspiration where I can about the things that I care about uh, when I can. So, I mean, I got, uh, I've got gotten ins inspiration from like Kerry Pratchett, um, who's easily one of my favorite authors. Um, I got, uh, at one point I was inspired on um, how to better help my coworkers uh, because of a TED talk that mm -hmm. was on something completely different. And uh, actually, most recently, the, uh, the bodega down the street from my house was recently taken over by some, uh, some guys from Yemen mm. um, who were refugees, and they came to America, and they picked up basically a part-time job, and then they picked up another part-time job, and then they picked up another part-time job, and then they picked yeah. up a full-time job, and they just kept working and working and working. And hearing them... Um, talk about, you know, the benefits that they get, like they work so they can make enough money to bring the rest of their family over. Sure. And then they work so they can get enough money to buy another bodega that they can give to that new family member. Sure. And seeing how like a well-run, a well-managed workplace is empowering. Yeah. And then I remember every workplace I've ever had that was the opposite or full of politics or full of nepotism or full of ageism, sexism, racism, any other ism you want to throw at it. <laughs> and it just, uh, it, it, it infuriates me enough that that's what I want to do every day. Like yeah. that's, that's literally the thing that makes me care about the field. Yeah. I think there's a wide variety of improvement that can be made. So I'm glad that this is something that you're thinking oh, about. Yeah. I have to say though, in thinking about the bodega down the street from you, that is one thing that I miss about New York City being able to walk around the corner, get any number mm -hmm. of things that you need in your life and yep. be back home within 15 minutes. Right. Oh my God. Like uh, moving up here from Baltimore, um, at probably the, the, my favorite apartment that I ever rented was a five minute walk from a 7-Eleven and a five minute walk from a Royal Farms, which is the equivalent would be sort of like a much classier 7-Eleven. Okay. So 7-Eleven on one side, much classier 7-Eleven on the other side. But <laughs> Look, Rofo chicken is no joke. Like if you ever have a chance to be in Baltimore, because Lord knows when we'll be able to travel again, but, um, <laughs> Baltimore, uh, Royal farms only exists in Maryland and it is hands down some of the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life. Okay. But I, I swear by Rofo, but yeah, no, having bodegas is great. Like yeah. there's three, like four actually within like a five minute walk from where I live. And there's never been a time where I've been like, you know what I really want? I really want this one thing I can't get. That's right. So cool. Because the competing products and just the sheer density of what exists on the shelves. Right. If you think you've experienced everything in a bodega, literally change your angle of viewing like 30 yes. degrees up. And you'll realize right. there's a whole other universe mm -hmm. of things that you didn't realize were there. But it's because right. they have such tiny spaces, um, mm -hmm. such limited shelf space. Um, yep. they, they've had to be really creative about how they merchandise. 
Yep. And yeah. then also, uh, like depending on the bodega, you can walk in through the front door and you see exactly what you want and you walk out and that's your totality of your experience with them. That's right. So nowadays, uh, whenever I, if I'm, if it's even the bodegas that I know, I still walk all the way to the back and then all the way to the front yeah. just because there's so much stuff. Cause, I know. uh, in some of them, it's like, it looks like the store ends, but then you cross a certain, like a point and you realize, Oh no, that's just the back. That's the back section. And then you turn a corner and Oh my God, there's a whole other path pile of stuff. It's awesome. That's right. So you have taken these ideas around work and how we can work better, how we can learn. And you've written two books recently and we'll link to them in the show notes. So that way people know how to access them. But I'd love to talk about some of these ideas that you posit in the books. You know, the first book is called Brush Fire and the opening image is very powerful. The way that you start the book. Would you be open to reading the first few paragraphs of the opening? Oh, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll just condense a little bit if that's okay. That's um, just use the, so you're walking through a forest and there are huge tree trunks and the bark is cracked and craggy and the trees are dimming the light with their massive branches. The underbrush is so thick that each step is like wading into the ocean. Mm. This is your forest. You've inherited from a long lost relative who called it an orchard, but looking around, you're wondering how, you know, gnarled branches here, fallen trees there. How could anything really grow here? And then how could you even harvest anything from here? Mm -hmm. So you decide the new inheritor to clean it up. But where do you get started? You get started right, right here, right where you're standing, where you've just you know, waded through some underbrush or do you walk the perimeter? Do you walk the entire forest and you make a list of things that you need to change? And that's where I kick it off. That's yeah. roughly where we start. That's such a visceral image. I love because I think we can we can put ourselves in that situation of someone coming into a place that used to be something else, um, mm-hmm. wondering how it was ever this other thing, and how mm-hmm. you get to that change state. Yeah, exactly. That was the intention. the The, the challenge for me was. How do I convey what I feel when, when addressing an operational challenge for the first time? Yeah. And for me, it's always felt like that. Just somebody explains to me what they do. Somebody explains to me how their department works or how their company works or how their particular job works. And after they explain it to me and then they say, oh, and then I do this. Yeah. Like, wait, 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 your job description said this thing. Yeah. What you're doing is that thing. Yeah. I have no idea what to even begin. Like, do we, <laughs> do we fix what you're doing and streamline it, even if it ends up pointing in the opposite direction of what your job description says? Yeah. Or do we start with your job description and say, well, maybe we should change your job description to match what you're actually doing? Yeah. Or is it something completely different? Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, it's, it's, that was the closest image I could think of is, suddenly having a big problem thrust into your lap and that problem being, hey, here's an orchard, grow, grow apples. Yeah, it's, it's very succinct. So in the first section, you talk about this notion of power being a mechanism of corruption. And you specifically mm-hmm. talk about the Stanford prison experiments and Milgram's obedience experiments. Can you break that down a little bit for us? Like what does all of that sure. mean in the context of a workplace and or you know this environment in which a lot of us willingly opt into? So the Stanford prison experiments, uh, which were done by Philip Zimbardo Mm -hmm. or Dr. Zimbardo or Zim, uh, (laughs) he basically took a group of young men um, and uh, they were just, you know, psych students and he randomly assigned them to either a guard or prisoner status. And then he put them in the prison, which finger quotes prison, was basically just like a couple of rooms in the uh, in the administrative building he was in, and he basically played the role. Zimbardo himself played the role of the warden. Okay, and he basically instructed the guards to just enforce obedience. And I mean, there's more details, but the gist of it is: let's see what happens when we play act at authority. Yeah, because the idea was that well, I've just I've told you you're the guard. I've told you you're the, you're the prisoner. We're all students here. We're all reasonable people. Sure. But let's see how this let's see how this shakes out. Yeah. Well, the results were, well, to put it bluntly, horrific. 
<laughs> um, people flat out did not expect. I mean, even after even after Zimbardo published his work, nobody expected. Everybody thought it was nutso. The guards basically psychologically terrorized the prisoners, wow. and the prisoners thought that they deserved it and didn't fight back. Mm. Zimbardo himself, the finger quotes warden, completely lost perspective. Um, and he admits as much in, in several um, interviews, which, man, um, basically he had to be dragged back to reality by a friend of his. Mm. Um, be and before he was like, oh, crap, you're right. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> and I think probably the most banal conclusion you can draw from this is that people change when they're given authority. And I feel like that's the most nobody can argue with that. That's about as banal an argument as you can come to. Sure. But that tells us people change when they're given authority. But mm. what about the other side of the equation? And that's sort of what Milgram's work was focused on. So um, Stanley Milgram uh, basically showed that people were willing to do horrible things in the face of authority. Mm. So it's not just that people were given authority. It's just somebody else was an authority, asked them to do stuff. I see. So the Milgram experiments in, in psychology are relatively famous. Outside of psychology, not so much, even though they made a couple of movies with it, which yeah. caught me off guard. Uh, one's with Skarsgård uh, and the other one's with uh, Shatner. Oh, okay. Um, but the actual the actual documentary of it is available on YouTube, and it is, oh, oh it is <laughs> it is it is definitely it's definitely one of those things that I can't watch like regularly, or else it just breaks my brain. Okay. So in Milgram's experiments, he would have a subject sit down in front of a box. The box would have a bunch of switches. Okay. And then an experimenter, just in a like lab coat, would say, "Okay, here's the thing. There's a, there's somebody else on the other side of the wall." They're going to read out word pairs. Okay. You have a list of word pairs in front of you. Okay. When they will read off word one, they'll read off word two. If they're wrong, flip a switch. Mm. And you have to start to go from left to right on the switches. On the left, very low, mild shock. On the right, it just had the letters like X. I see. And then the next one had XX, and the last one said XXX. Like, literally, we're not talking about it anymore. Yeah. So basically, you just could only flip each switch once, and you sat down, and people would flip the switches as they went on. Right. What the subjects didn't know is that the person on the other side was one of the co-conspirators. And by about halfway through the zapping, they would start saying things like, hey, I want to quit. Hey, I'm done. Hey, this really hurts. Hey, I have a heart problem. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. And the subject would then say, as most people would, um, this guy really doesn't want to do it. I'm not sure we should still keep doing this. Sure. And all the experimenter would say, the guy in the lab coat would say, you must continue for the experiment. Hmm. Um, polite voice. Almost every one of those test subjects went all the way to lethal levels of electrocution to the point where the person on the other side didn't respond. Oh, wow. Now, admittedly, nobody was actually being electrocuted, but the people performing the, 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 the switch flipping had no idea. Sure. And so that gives us the, both sides of the equation. People change from student to psychologically terrorizing prison guard. Yeah. And people change on the other side where they're willing to kill another person because somebody just asked them politely to flip some switches. Right. For the sake of the experiment, yeah. Exactly. Zimbardo and Milgram both were dealing with the challenges of trying to, you know, reconcile what happened in the Holocaust. Yeah. That's why they were doing the research. But even now, if you look back on what their work showed us and the amount of rework and unwork that people have done over the decades to try and make sense of it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a core problem of the way human beings are wired. And we still don't have a finger quote solution for it. We just know that ugh, power corrupts and sure. absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Sure. So what this showed me and probably shows any halfway decent student of psychology is the banality of the cruelty that we are capable of, mm. especially if we insist on obeying and being obeyed. Right. Like I, those, those poor guys, like they flipped over a rock and they probably thought they were going to find like a few strange bugs and they basically <laughs> uncovered, you know, a nightmarish horror that is the human mind. Right. And all it is, is that when people are given authority, they change. And when yeah. people, when people say, oh, well, you have authority, I have to do what you say, they change. Yeah. And it's just baked into what we are. Now, take that and then factor it into the workplace. Yeah. Well, the workplace is a constructed environment. Sure. We're not here to electrocute people for word lists. 
we and think. we're not clear to, well, as far as we know right to say <laughs> the new duolingo comes with a uh, with a shop call <laughs> but we're also you know when people are promoted or people are given a position like okay now you're the manager right well we can't assume that that manager is not going to be affected yeah. we can't assume that just because they were a nice person that yeah. they'll be a nice boss yeah so as you know, considering that work is completely artificial, yeah. well, there's no reason not to put in stop gaps. There's no reason not to put in things that can bend or twist behavior. Because, you know, when we're talking about things more widespread than work, when we're talking about politics, when we're talking about interpersonal relationships, when we're talking about other sociological tendencies, then, yeah, that's when you have to have a little push and pull, a little discourse and debate becomes extremely important. But in the workplace? Yeah. It should be unacceptable. Like yeah. it should be completely unacceptable for somebody to be allowed to be put into the position where they were just following orders. But it should also be impossible to allow somebody who's been put in a position of authority to basically cause damage to everybody else. It's unacceptable. Yeah. And so that's why I think that the and so Brush Fire of the two books is more of the psychological, like overarching mindset perspective and so without the acknowledgement that power corrupts we can't really even begin to talk about authority we can't even begin to talk about what it's like to be a boss and an employee mm. even you know does it matter that the ceo said so yeah well it does or doesn't is kind of a fungible question but if the ceo could tell his entire staff and the entire company cool guys tomorrow we're going to start electrocuting babies right well I don't know. That shouldn't happen, but who's to say? Right. Yeah. I'm being glib, but yes, that's basically why I started with Power Corrupts. Yeah, I think that's an, an important element to recognize is that uh, just because it's something that has been agreed upon by some group of people within the workplace doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. 110%. And also remembering that the workplace is a constructed environment and everything in the workplace is something we put in place yeah. saying that, Oh, well, that's just how it's always done to me is a red flag. Yeah. That's, you know, that, that's waving a flag in front of the bull, but that's also, Hey, maybe somebody should be watching us. Yeah. Almost every job I've ever worked and I've worked quite a few. Um, and people I've talked to in all of their jobs, there's certain things in certain industries that people just assume is the way it's supposed to be done yeah. no matter who it hurts. And that's, that's galling. Yeah. One of the other pieces of the framework that you put together in Brushfire is around this idea of it's always the system. What does that mean? Ooh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I think the best way to look at that is, so everybody makes mistakes. You sure. know? And it's obvious to each of us when we make a personal mistake. Yeah. You go to the bodega and you pick up skim milk instead of <laughs> Sure. Um, you close the wrong tab on your browser. Sure. You know, you're trying to lose weight, but... Damn it if those Krispy Kremes aren't fresh. <laughs> that um, blinking light. Oh my God, the hot now light. Oh. <laughs> oh, they just opened they just opened the first hot now. Well, not the first, but the most the only hot now in New York. Oh wow. And I am I am there for it because <laughs> that's the one thing I miss so much. Because I, I love the Krispy Kreme, but getting a hot now Krispy Kreme is that's a whole other game. And it they is. just I mean, they opened it up just before the lockdown. So oh, wow. I am Oh man, I am chomping at the bit. And is it in the city or is it? It is in it is in Manhattan. I believe it's near Times Square. Okay, as and it, it should be. Like, yeah, as well it should be. But yeah. it's it's definitely. I mean, the one time I ventured out to possibly see what it was like, there was a line of tourists around the corner. So I'm absolutely not going there. Sure. Not until much later, because right. I have I love a donut, but I also like breathing. <laughs> Fair. Okay. So you make mistakes. You know, you made mistakes. You castigate yourself, you forgive yourself, you work yeah. with within yourself. That's fine. But it's not as obvious when somebody else makes a mistake. Yeah. Like did somebody like my example usually is, well, if they emailed you an unfinished document, yeah. did they mean to send you an unfinished document and they're asking for your help completing it? Or did they make a mistake and send you the wrong document? Sure. Somebody was in a mood in, in, in a mood or was to be fair, just being a dick <laughs> in a meeting. Were they, are they a dick? Or were they hungry as hell, right? Sure. Did somebody miss a deadline intentionally because yeah. they were like, I don't really care? Or were the kids sick? Yeah. Right? So hard to tell. Like when it's yourself, you have access to all the information, but somebody else, you don't. Right. So people in the workplace 
point at a failure, a mistake, a widget that's the wrong shape, or a missed deadline, and sure. they say, oh, that's so-and-so's fault. Yeah. Well, I have a problem with that, yeah. because where's the acknowledgement of any of the ambiguity that's around those sorts of problems, right? Where's the acceptance that mistakes happen, mm -hmm. and nobody's perfect, but also no machine is perfect. Yeah. I mean, there's bit flip errors in almost every in every OS known to man, so you know, we just have error correction. Right. But when I say that the problem is the system and it's always the system, yeah. it's that without acknowledging that work is completely constructed, without acknowledging that we can't just do things as we've always done them, we punish people or reward them for things that have nothing to do with what they actually do, mm. how they can company, how they contribute to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And instead of just saying, well, it looks like the system that we have in place doesn't account for that kind of variability. Sure. It looks like the system that we have in place is not rewarding the right attitude, the right behavior. It looks like the system we have in place is punishing the wrong, you know, the wrong thing. And it's actually rewarding the right thing. It's, sure. it starts getting tricky because unless you approach the system itself as something that you can modify, yeah. then you never have a system that can adapt to mistakes and faults without coming to a complete grinding halt. Yeah. So that's what I mean by it's always the system. And I, and I think that lines up to some of the things that I've seen. I mean, I work in the design industry and I'm seeing more and more positions come available that are labeled things like change management. Right, right. Change management, man. So change management has been, so my background is in instructional systems design. That's what I got my master's in. That's what I did for like 15 years. Sure. We hated hearing instead of change management. <laughs> we hated it. Because the problem is that if you're a trainer and if you've been working in instructional design, instructional systems design in any way, shape or form, you know what happens is somebody somewhere in some meeting somewhere decides that, hey, we're going to roll up this new software platform. Sure. And you as the trainer now have to train the staff on how to use this new software platform or use this new widget. Right. Okay, fine. Well, is it done being configured? No, we haven't finished making it. We haven't finished configuring it. You just have to make the training. Sure. Well, I can't really make the training until you're done making, giving you the system. Right. Well, we decided to launch the system, say, November the 1st. Cool. When do I get access to it? Well, you don't get access to the finished version. That's the one we have to launch. <laughs> right. Well, what the hell, man? <laughs> But also, usually when change management just gets rolled out into those sorts of situations, the change management people or the change management team right. has to juggle not only the project itself, which is, well, how do we get the software up and running? Let's use a software platform just so I can stop jumping around for my analogies. Sure. So how do we get the software platform configured and then launched? Yeah. But they may not necessarily also be factoring, well, how do we get it configured to the point where we can build training so we can teach people on how to use it, right. give them chances to make mistakes in it, knock off all the edges before we go live with it. Right. But there's also the other problem, which is if you don't factor in that extra lag time, yeah. it doesn't actually affect the launch, yeah. which is kind of like the paradox of training where you don't necessarily, people use iPhones. Has anybody actually taken a class on how to use an iPhone? Probably, Probably not. Yeah. not. And I mean, to use some of the cooler features, of course, you may to go sure. to the Apple store and take an extra class. Sure. But if you think about that, what is it? It's a small metal and glass rectangle that gives you access to, you know, more computing power than they needed to reach the moon. Yeah. And it gives you cats. So <laughs> kudos. <laughs> If, if people can do that, then why would there be any assumption that there should be a learning curve for using a software platform? Yeah. Well, the assumption is there because the software platform is probably not that user-friendly. That's right. And that's never baked into the whole change management argument. Right. It's never baked into the argument that, well, we're switching a system. The system itself is broken in different ways, and we need to help our people through the problem. Yeah. When in fact, when I cover this a little bit more in Flywheel, the, the fact is that people self-teach all the time. And mm -hmm. they te self-teach faster and more efficiently than individuals can ever pull that off. Like you can't make a system to teach somebody faster than the way they teach themselves, especially when you're dealing with adults, huh. which I mean, we are. Yeah. And that's kind of why I'm – I mean, I agree that change management is necessary. As much as I agree that project, project management is necessary, it is a necessity. Yeah. But – I also feel like sometimes people, that's a band-aid. People yeah. throw, like training was a band-aid. They just throw training at the problem. They throw change management at the problem. They throw project management at the problem, but they never stop to say, wait, why is there even a problem? What is the meaning of this? What are we doing? Right. And 
I understand the uses and abuses of, of the, of the terminology, but just the word change management still gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm working on it. <laughs> sure. I'm working on it. Sure. So there's one last concept that um, you talk about in Brushfire that I want to get into. You use this term, the Ben Franklin effect. Ah, yes. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, so it's actually a pretty cool story. Um, I'm 80% sure it's not apocryphal. Um, <laughs> but who's to say? Right. But uh, basically the story goes that uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of our founding fathers, uh, knew that somebody else just didn't like it. Uh, it happens that that guy had a massive library full of really cool books. Mm. And so Ben Franklin asked him for a favor. He said, hey, can I borrow this really cool book that I know you're the only person who has a copy of? Mm. Of, course, of course, the guy said, well, yeah, okay, fine. You can borrow the book. Sure. But, and here's the fun part, it actually caused a massive amount of cognitive dissonance in that guy's head. And it actually made him like Benjamin Franklin afterwards. So... Basically, if you ask your enemies for favors, mm. they may not see you as an enemy anymore. Mm. Not because they are now helping you, but because logically, you just don't do favors for enemies. Yeah. So if they did you a favor, you must not be an enemy. Yeah. It's a weird little mental hack. And there's lots and lots of people who talk about doing this. YouTube is full of them. There's talk about doing it manually, doing it. But I think really... The best way to approach the what the lesson of that is is that it's it's proof that if you ask for help, the worst thing you can get is a no, yeah. and the best is probably more than you could have asked for. Yeah. So it's kind of crucial that you ask for favors. You ask for help, and I know personally I'm terrible at it. Like I, <laughs> like I am the worst, and uh, I've I've been well, I've been called to the carpet by fan, by friends and family for that particular fault of my own. So. Sure. But it's, it's an awesome function. It's an awesome function of the human brain that, uh, you know, when we do nice things for people, we can't see them as bad people. We can't see them as enemies. Yeah. I, I feel like there's something in this example of the Ben Franklin mm -hmm. effect that feels something around how do we involve and include other people in the work that we're doing yes, yes, and yes. building those relationships and building those bridges to make sure that people are being represented, of course. Mm -hmm. But then also, how do we enlist people to help us in the work that we're doing, but also do their best work as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that there's also something to factor in here is that people will never give you their all if they feel like you don't value all of them. Mm. So, you know, if you're a person of color like myself, immigrant like myself, sure. uh, and you're in a board meeting and nobody's listening, and in fact, nobody's even asking questions, mm. and every part of the conversation is... You know, you can't even raise your hand to raise a point and mm. they're just kind of railroading over you. But, but there, there are definitely times that I've, I've had meetings with various coworkers, you know, various ages, various genders, various identifications, various, you know, all the variouses. Sure. And it's been an active fight to pull the meeting away from somebody and give it to somebody else and say, wait, you had a really good point that he interrupted you. What are you saying? Yeah. You had a really good point, but she interrupted you. What are you saying? Please yeah. tell me, you know? Yeah. And, and I feel like inclusion from the perspective of the Ben Franklin effect, if we, if we can sort of connect those two things, I feel like inclusion from the perspective of, well, this person in this department is antagonistic towards this department and these people. Mm. Well, is it the people in the departments or is it the fact that you've put these departments at opposition? Yeah. That they aren't actually working together. That one is setting deadlines that the other one has to follow, and the other one has to push back on those deadlines. Sure. Well, again, going back to it's always a system. Well, then why the hell are you doing that? Right. Why is team A creating a deadline that team B has to follow? Right. And why are they not working collaboratively? Why right. are they not sharing effort? Why are they not doing favors for each other? Yeah. Because you can't expect to create an antag to basically design a system that feeds and promotes antagonism yeah. and then be surprised that people are jerks. <laughs> you just basically, you know, you, you, it, it's, it does what it says on the tin, man. Right. And like you literally right. create, you, you basically, you, you made a, you made the Thunderdome. <laughs> you can't be mad when two men enter, one man leave. It's just, you did it. Yeah. And now that's your fault. So yeah. yeah, no, I agree. It's a, it's a, ooh, it's a, it's a sticky wicket. Yeah. It's probably the nicest way to phrase that. Yeah. So in your second book, and again, we'll link to both of them in the show notes so listeners can have access to both volumes. It's called The Flywheel and the Lever. 
Mm-hmm. And the story that you start this book with is around creating an instructional system out of open source technologies. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Well, uh, in hindsight, it was a terrible idea. Uh, well, I mean, not a terrible idea. I mean, it, it worked and it did everything it was supposed to, but man, I ran through so many cases of Red Bull just to get that thing to work. And you're talking specifically about creating the instructional system, right? Specifically That's what about we're referencing. That. Yeah, okay. yeah, specifically yeah. about that. Okay. So basically, it was what happens when you take a freshly minted grad student, well, graduate, master's degree graduate, and uh, say, okay, how do you solve this problem? We have no budget, <laughs> but we also aren't going to stop you with whatever crazy thing you want to come up with. <laughs> so that happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But basically, I was uh, hired on as a contractor, basically making e-learning videos. Okay. And it was going to be one of those contracts that almost everybody you know, in the, in the contract world just dreams of, which is, this is perpetual work. There will mm. never not be a need for more of this. You basically can keep doing this forever. Okay. But the guy who was the head of the contract, who then would eventually become my boss, um, actually asked me, hey, is this the best way to do this? Mm. And... Again, young, fresh grad, a head full of ideas. Um, I said, no, I don't think it is. And then I sat down and I sketched out a better plan and then I handed it to him. And he looked at it and he asked for some, you know, okay, wait, so what does this do? And how does this work? And where does sure. this go? And what is it? It was just a little back and forth. And yeah. then he said, hey, what would it cost? What would, what would your salary need to be to bring you in as a full-time employee? Okay. And I, of course, came up with some crazy number because I was, you know, I had a, I had a, I had a cushy contract. Right. And the next day, he had the, uh, the offer letter with the exact amount that I quoted him in front of me. And he said, if you're going to sign this, we can talk about, you know, canceling your contract and you'd become a full-time employee tomorrow. Huh. So, of course, this man who hired me was stark raving mad <laughs> because nobody in their right mind should have done anything like that. But, hey. <laughs> Well, of course you said, signed. Yes, yes. Of course I signed because, yes. hey, it's already insane. Let's just let's see what this crazy train's going. So basically I had – it was just me and him, and he was in charge of all the meetings and budgeting stuff, but I was in charge of everything else, and I had to build out an instructional system and okay. in, a whole thing, kit and caboodle, top to bottom. So first chunk was all the documentation, all the stuff that was written down. They had Word documents printed and saved – in almost every department, they were completely different. They also had three ring binders. And it was the first time in my life that I ever saw a six ring binder. And I don't mean like where all six rings are on the same spine. Mm. I mean, two, three ring binders connected by a single flap. It was just Stop. these massive tomes. They were awesome, although horrifying, because that was <laughs> what they had to use for reference. And right. so I took all of that. And I had to go find a good chunk of it and I had to email people and ask people to give me copies of the files that they had sitting on their desktops right. and cram it all into a wiki, which I basically had to first identify the right one and then learn its markup language and then figure out how I was going to use regex and a bunch of other you know neat nerd tricks to basically scrub all of those Word documents and PDFs and whatever and jam them into this, uh, this, this wiki and then organize all the information. Simple. Oh, yeah, totally fine. Totally yeah. simple. Yeah. I definitely lost track of how many <laughs> nights I passed out at my desk. Right. And so, so that happened. So that was all the documentation side. Then I also had all of the, all those e-learning videos, but I had to kind of organize them better. So I had to find an LMS, a learning management system. So I found mm-hmm. a nice open source one. I figured out enough of the, of the backend so I could figure out how to connect it to the wiki. And then I said, okay, cool. Now we've got these two things. Let's keep working on that. Sure. All of that took me about... <sighs> six months okay. to go from nothing to something um, and zero dollars. Um, so I had no budget and I had to do it all myself. Right. And actually, I think I got most of it done within, the, within three to four months. It was just the last two months for me going, oh God, I didn't, ex- I didn't expect that to work. Oh God, I didn't expect mm. that to break. Okay. So I want to I wanna back it up because there are a couple things that you talk about in the flywheel and the lever mm-hmm. as being sort of foundational to the way that you now think about this experience. Oh. So yes. you mentioned that there's an article written by Donella Meadows. Yes. That was foundational yeah. for you. How is it foundational? And can you break that down a little bit? I, I cannot speak more highly of Donella Meadows than, I mean, I just, I lack the words. I lack the eloquence. Hell, I lack the brain. She's, the work she did, my God, 
So yeah, sorry, I could uh, I should actually probably say what she did. But she basically uh, she basically studied and did a lot of work with complex systems. Okay. Now these could be systems as complex as economies, um, or they could be as complex as I mean, and I mean like small scale economies, like the economy of a city, Got it. as opposed to the economy of the globe. Got it. Uh, but also like weather systems and weather weather patterns. Like if you can think of a complex system that is hard to really understand the inputs and outputs of, she probably did work related to it. Interesting. Okay. But the article that I specifically remember and almost almost never leaves my head, it's basically like her work for me is almost like a koan. It's mm. almost like a it, it's supposed to be like a paradoxical statement that opens your mind. That's what a koan's supposed to do. Sure. But reading her work feels the same way mm. as the first time I read, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping or um, any of the things from the Tao Te Ching where it was just like, oh, shit. Mm. Right. My brain hurts. Okay. Reading her work is exactly like that. Okay. So uh, she had an article that was specific about leverage points, which basically um, lists out where interventions in a complex system have the greatest impact. Okay. But the part that still sticks to me and still speaks to me personally, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here because, again, I may know it by heart, but, man, my, my brain ain't that good. <laughs> uh, basically, she points out that human cultures are the repositories of behavioral repertoires. Okay. And human cultures accumulate this information over hundreds of thousands of years. Sure. And that's the stock, that's the bedrock from which social evolution of any form can come from, Okay, are these cultures. But while people appreciate things like genetic variation, yeah. they don't necessarily appreciate cultural variation as much. Mm. Because it's key to almost every aspect of human cultural explanation that it's, it's a core belief that their culture is superior to another culture. Mm. Whether superior to all cultures is some arguments, but superior to a culture or to one specific culture. Mm. It's just part of how it's built because we can even talk about things like subcultures. Um, I find it's easier to talk about subcultures rather than talking about larger cultural things because people can, can lock on to thinking about subcultures within their own culture as opposed to thinking about a completely radically different culture. So yeah. for example... If you're really, really, really into country music, okay. that is your subculture, then you believe country music is inherently superior to, let's say, something like lo-fi hip-hop. Okay. And so you believe that, and that is an aspect of your culture. In fact, people in that culture, people who are in the subculture of liking country music, will almost never say, oh, I'm in the subculture of liking country music, but I hate country music. That's... <laughs> See, that's what I mean by like, that is literally impossible. Yeah. Like you cannot have that. But if you think about cultural superiority, people look at a culture and their own culture, the one that they grew up in. Yeah. And they can't find something in that culture that they hate or something that they despise or look at another culture and say, well, that culture is clearly superior to my own. Mm. They may say, well, some aspects of my culture are not as good as that culture, but overall mine is better. I see. Right. So you end up with those sorts of arguments. Um, but the insistence of, that people have on having a single culture, it shuts down resilience. It shuts down learning. It shuts down adaptability. Right. So the more you reduce the number of cultures in play, the harder a system can adapt. Because mm -hmm. what you've basically done is you've removed the bedrock. You've removed the stock out of which social evolution can come out of yeah. by basically saying, well, this culture is better than that culture. Well, great. Now you've just created a fragile system. Right. And any system that avoids experimentation or avoids or getting rid of things that are unique and different and innovative, any system that does that eventually fails and collapses in on itself. Mm. So we don't want that. And yeah. so, so considering that I was born and raised and in like imbued in like six or seven different cultures when I was a kid. Yeah. So reading that made me go, well, crap. Maybe I don't have to reduce myself down to a single culture. I've been exposed to so much. Yeah. Well, that makes me weird. That makes me different. That makes it hard for me to fit in. But that's a great reason to leverage that to figure out solutions to systems that only somebody who's had as much of a disjointed upbringing could actually come up with. Yeah. So that's why it like it's foundational. It's basically baked into who, how I think. Yeah. These days, I no longer accept statements like, oh, well, that's just the way it's always done or, oh, we've always done it this way or things like 
well, you know, that's an industry standard right. or that's standard practices. Eh, get out of here with that. Don't right. give me that. That's, right. that's like saying we will only listen to country music. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you really want to appreciate country music, you got to listen to the blues. Right. If you really want to listen to the, if you really want to listen to the blues, you got to listen to some jazz yeah. and so on. Yeah. I'm wondering about people who uh, don't necessarily subscribe to the culture that they were raised in. Um, mm-hmm. Folks mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. maybe were raised in another country and just for sake of the example, like they moved to America and, and you know, they're mm-hmm. first generation Americans. They don't speak yeah. the language of their culture. They know nothing about their culture other than some very top line things. How, yeah. how does yeah. that... Yeah, right. So I wonder how that manifests for someone who has opted out of a culture that maybe they knew very well at some point in, in their life, right. but they have decided that they don't want anything to do with it. So that's an interesting point in in parallel. Um, so like I said, my mother and my father, when they got married, that was, you know, taboo back home. Sure. And so when we were growing up, my parents basically had the choice of teaching us a language that would allow us to apply ourselves in all the cultural situations. And so yeah. they just settle on English. Yeah. So whereas my father spoke 11 languages and my mother speaks eight, Yeah. although to be fair, speaks five fluently, the other three she's a little broken on. Um, my sister and I oh, only speak yeah. English. Yeah. Um, and we did that before we even came to the States. Sure. Um, before we even came to America, we were still only speaking English because sure. it was just easier than trying to have us learn multiple languages. Right. There's a lot of aspects of Indian culture that I do not appreciate, even though I was raised there. And yeah. I was raised seeing all these variations of it. But there's a lot of aspects of American culture that I don't truly appreciate. Sure. There's a lot of aspects of, and I think that as you, as you grow and become an adult, there has to be a point where you look at any given culture and you, and you pick and choose. Yeah. And I think that the failure is assuming that because you don't fit in 100%, mm. that that is your fault. And mm. it's not. Mm. It is a failure of the culture to not be inclusive, not mm. a failure of the person mm. to be, to, to prune themselves into the shape. At least that's the way I look at it. Yeah. I think that if we, if we forced everybody to be the same, we'd never have David Bowie for God's sakes. Sure. Like if we forced everybody to be the same, Freddie Mercury would never have been a musician. He would yeah. never have sung. Yeah. And that's just, that's two recent musicians. I'm not even talking about like, the list Let's goes on and on, it. yeah. And as an immigrant, speaking of an immigrant talking about first gen, yeah, I actually have a serious bone to pick with a lot of first gen uh, Indian folk mm. because they seem to have this artificially crude and harsh view of what back home is like. Mm. And I grew up there. So I know what it was like. And right. sometimes I have conversations with first-gen um, Indian folk, especially in New York, it's happened a couple of times, where I have to point out, look, I have more in common with your parents than I do with you, even though I'm your age. Mm. Like I have so much more in common with your parents because we can talk about the food we miss. Yeah. We can talk about the things we miss doing. We can talk about, you know, how nice it was to sometimes just, you know, you, you get on a train and then like you fall asleep on the train, you wake up in the morning and you're in the middle of a nature preserve and in 20, 30 minutes, some kid's going to come running up and he's going to you know, sell you coffee or tea. Sure. And you can't do that here. I mean, yeah. where the hell am I going to see an elephant in the wild in New, in America? <laughs> right. It's probably not going to happen. But right. I still think that those kids are doing themselves a disservice because they're trying to fit into a mold of a theoretical culture that doesn't really exist that way. Yeah. And so we, as people, as adults, it also behooves us to turn to each other and say, you know, we may disagree on being a vegan, being a carnivore, being a, you know, an omnivore, yeah. but that doesn't mean that I'm going to exclude you from what, what I consider to be my culture sure. and my tribe, yeah. to paraphrase Seth Good. I also definitely think that that personal, that the jarring sensation of realizing that you won't fit in. Um, unless you do this, that, or the other is something that middle school and high school beats into a lot of Americans. Sure. Um, and it, I mean, culturally it also beats it, beats it into people in more restrictive collectivist cultures, yeah. um, like, and in China and India. Yeah. And if we don't accept that, if we don't make that a part of ourselves, 
and, it, and integrate it into our own cultural expression, yeah. then we're doing not only ourselves a disservice, we're doing the species a disservice. Because sure. if we were all homogenous, we'd be, you know, if everybody's just a clone of each other, we get wiped out. Yeah. Like by anything. Right now, it's genetic variation that, you know, that people are trying to, the Cavendish banana and the Gros Michel. <laughs> right are perfect examples of what happens when you have a monoculture. Right. So when people talk about having a monoculture of any sort, well, we're going to have this kind of a thing and everybody's going to do the same. Oh, no, no, no. Right. We need everybody. Like we need crazed lunatics who are wearing tinfoil hats and screaming about alien mind control rays as much as we need, a, you know, a, a cancer doctor who like, uh, oh, God, I forgot her name. The one who just cured uh, cancer nanoparticles. I just saw the article. Oh, oh um, um, but yes, she's also awesome. too. Yeah, right. But that's what I mean. Like we need both of those people in the species. Why? Because yeah. we don't know. Right. Are we greater or lesser than the sum of our parts? Yeah. So, yeah. I appreciate you walking through that because I think that some of these backtracking, some of these fundamental, and really they're assumptions that we've made. Right. We've codified some of these assumptions mm -hmm. and say this is the way that we operate it. This is the way that the world works. When you go back and you start really examining them and thinking about them, I think that's when they begin to break apart. You have this great line yeah. in um, Flywheel and the Lever mm -hmm. where you say, if you had to read the entirety of The Joy of Cooking before you ever cook breakfast, you'd starve to death. And I think like there's yeah. no way we can know everything about everything, yes. be that expert before we start doing mm -hmm. a thing because we're mm -hmm. going to mess up. We're going to screw it up mm -hmm. because that's what happens. And then we Absolutely. we try it again and we do it differently. We do it better or maybe just try to do it again. Maybe not yeah. mess up as badly or I, I don't know what yeah. the metric is, but. Yeah, lather, rinse, repeat, man. Like you just, that you, sometimes, and, and paralysis by analysis is just, it's a wonderful rhyming phrase. Yeah. But the fact is that I agree a hundred percent. If you don't go out and try something and make a mistake, you won't know exactly what you need to fix. Like, right. So we've mentioned your second book, The Flywheel and the mm -hmm. Lever. Can you walk us through some of the the titular concept in broad strokes? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I think the shortest version and probably the most succinct way to phrase it would be you need to build out a system that relies on people mm. and puts them above everything else. Yeah. So people first. Yeah. Then you make a process that takes that turns inputs into outputs. Okay. And that's all you have to do. Just define your inputs, define your outputs. Sure. And then you let the people, because they're above everything else, figure yeah. out the details. Right. Just let the people figure out the details. The system, the process, inputs, outputs, let people handle all the extra details. Okay. If you notice that for some reason the outputs aren't aren't the outputs that you expected, sure. you tweak the system. You don't tweak the people. Mm. You tweak the system out to fix those inputs and outputs. And then finally, fine, if you really insist on it, if you really got to, you can use some fancy schmancy technology. It might help, right. but it might also hurt. And you got to be real careful with that. So it goes people, process, technology in that order. Right. You make a point in the book where you talk about technology as being irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Why? Ah, okay. So we're in 2021. So let's talk about 2020 because, hey, uh, PTSD being what it is. <laughs> but uh, so if COVID and lockdowns have shown us anything, it's that more jobs than anybody ever admitted can be done from home. Right. Um, it's definitely not a new thing. Right. We didn't create break breakthrough technology in, in March, although we are finding that the technology that we thought was breakthrough is just broken. <laughs> but uh, it, it's been the case for a while that we've known that you could people could work remotely. In fact, uh, Tim Ferriss's entire metier has been about the fact that he could do his job remotely. Sure. So a lot of people are like that. Silicon Valley let a lot of people, you know, spread their wings in that way. But yeah. it's more likely and more accurate to say that most companies were still caught up in the idea of a control management structure as opposed to a commitment management structure. Mm. And so they were still trying to force people into the office for eight hours. Sure. Because if I have you at your desk for eight hours, I will get eight hours work out of you. Sure. Which anybody who's been on the internet for any amount of time knows is not true. Because <laughs> nobody, nobody in their right mind would sit down and grind out eight hours of pure work and then get up like some sort of freakish automaton and go home. Right. 
you know, people take lunch breaks, people take psych breaks where they're basically like, I need coffee. Well, you don't really need coffee. You need a break from your desk and you'd like to talk to people around you. Right. That's different. Right. But similarly, there have been so many situations where a company will roll out a software platform or roll out a product yeah. to fix a business problem. Yeah. And it fixes part of the problem, but it starts a whole new one. Yeah. Right. It, it's part of the problem, but there's a whole new batch of new problems to deal with. Sure. In software development, it went from, oh, well, you need to have a massive monolithic system to, oh, no, you need a microservice. You need a series of microservices to That's now right. people are like, well, you kind of need a series of monoliths and microservices. <laughs> well, now you got to do all kinds of stuff and Docker is everywhere and Kubernetes and blah, 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 blah. It's just great. But have you actually solved the problem? Right. And for every tech bro that's like sniffing after VC funding for an AI driven asset management platform or some goofy thing, <laughs> let's be fair. There is literally nuclear ordinance controlled by the United States government that's running off of COBOL, right. which was one of the first programming languages. And man, is it hard to read. Right. Tools, tools are tools. Right? Right. Software is just software. Technology right. is just technology. They don't make right. us better or worse. Right. They just make us faster. And sometimes right. they might make us slower, but sometimes they make us faster. Right. So just like you don't become a better writer when you use a pen and notepad versus using a laptop, mm. you become a better writer by writing more. That's the difference, right? Sure. You could, like some writers, like swear by doing it longhand. Yeah. And some writers swear by doing it with technology. Yeah. But... In both cases, they will tell you it doesn't matter what technology, what tool you're using. You have to practice. You have to do it every day. Yeah. So if the technology is fungible, you know, yeah. like I, you could use a quill and, manu and manuscript, or you could use voice dictation. Yeah. Well, then, if the end, like, then we have to focus on the process right. and the people engaged in that process. So that's yeah. why. Like if you're sending emails or sending Slack chats or you've got Nerf darts with a post attached to it, like the technology is irrelevant. That's right. Like what matters is that you're communicating and yeah. how you communicate and what you're communicating and when you communicate it. That's what matters. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think that, you know, this notion of hard skills versus soft skills. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, hard skills are those things like you have to understand how to work certain tools and operate a laptop. and But then there's this like fuzzy set of things that we do as well that are about connecting with people and how we can see certain opportunities in a way, cut through some of that chatter, that signal to noise ratio and, mm -hmm. and kind of figure things out. But those aren't, that's not a bulleted list that you can say, you have to be able to do this thing X, yep. but this general idea of how we operate in a better way. Yes. And so like hard skills and soft skills, because I, I haven't really worked in the design field personally, but like I've worked in like so, like five person so startups out of somebody's basement and sure. I've worked with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, I've worked at a law firm and I've worked at a nonprofit and right. I've worked at a healthcare company. Like I've worked all over the place, and including a bookstore, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. But um, I think that the hard skills are easy to quantify. Mm -hmm. That's why they're hard. That's they're right. Simple. Can you do the thing? That's right. But the soft skills are really about, well, how good are you at being around people? Right. Like, can you work with people? Can you work with yourself? Are you emotionally aware? Right. Are you aware that you're being a dick, dude? <laughs> I think that the problem there is that the same people who quantize the hard skills yeah. are attempting to quantize the soft skills. Mm. That, I feel, is down that road lies danger. Yeah. Because it's it's very difficult to treat people like cogs in a machine. Yeah. But it is so easy. Yeah. It's difficult in the sense of what the ramifications will be. Of it's course. easy in the sense it's that way you can just simpler. Go, yeah. One person, two person, three person. Done. That's right. How many people do you need in the department? I need five people. Well, here's five people. Problem solved. Right. Except what if four of those people are jerks? And the fifth person is Satan himself. <laughs> so, right. So now you've got a team full of joiks right. doing, you know, they maybe they, their hard skills might be through the roof, but their right. soft skills are terrible. Right. And so they can't get anything done. Right. But I think that that also has something to do with the environment in which you put people. Yeah. I mean, there's several situations, heck, going back to Gamergate, where women were marginalized for no other reason than that they were women. Right. But if you were to, and some people have shown shown this in GitHub. If you were to remove any sexual identifier from their work, right, 
then there's no questions, there's no arguments right. about the quality of their work and, and, the, and the level of their uh, involvement. But that, that leads to the question, well, then how the hell are you letting that happen in meat space? Yeah. Not only online, right. online, that's a thing. Right. But in meat space, in actual, in your office, why are you letting this happen? Yeah. Why are you letting these women be be marginalized? Why are you letting them be minimized? Right. Well, the reason you're letting it happen is because you only measured the hard skills. Yeah. And now you're going to do implicit bias training, which is, I mean, I could I could spend an hour talking about how that's complete <laughs> and utter bullshit. Yeah. But I'm I'm pissing off quite a few people in my field, but it's true. <laughs> like, there's no data to support that assertion. Anyway. But oh yeah, so we're having we have a problem with racism in our office, so we're going to do implicit bias training. Right. Or counterpoint, you set up a system like you should that punishes the ever loving crap out of anybody who's a racist, mm. but also doesn't ignore the fact that different races exist. Right. <laughs> you kind of have to do both, and that's yeah. why it's so difficult, and that's why I think that. Constructing a system that puts people first is so important mm. because, again, it's difficult. Yeah. But my God, the results are, you know, they're unshakable. Yeah. But if you ignore that, if you ignore the people and you focus on like, oh, well, we're launching this techno this techno piece of technology, we don't need to care about our people. Right. Well, great. I, I, I hope you get sued. <laughs> so I think we could we could definitely continue talking and, you know, if our past conversations are any indicator. We usually end up budgeting for X amount of time and we usually end up going about X plus 30 minutes. Bare minimum. Um, <laughs> bare minimum. But I want to wrap things up. We'll have links to some of the things that we talked about in the show notes. So people will be able to dive deeper into some of these things. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also link to your books. But I want to get to our closing questions. Mm -hmm. What's one of the most important lessons that you've learned so far in your life or in, in the work that you've done, what's something you wish you learned earlier? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So this was one of those questions that plagued me because I've been thinking about it for a while. Yeah. And I think it's, it's hard for me to say because I don't think that anything that I now understand or now know could have been learned without all the mistakes I made before I got here. Oh. And I don't think that I would have appreciated what I know now without the context in which I've received it, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Like, it's one thing to say, oh, if I could go back in time and see myself in high school, I would tell myself, dude, get checklists. You've got a crappy, <laughs> crappy attention span. And you got to, like, if you have a checklist, you're getting a lot more stuff done, but you were right. going to forget more than you remember. I see. I wouldn't listen to myself because I was young. I was in high right. school. I was a kid, too. That's right. fine. I was right. a teenager. That's supposed to be nice people. That's their job. That's why they're teenagers. <laughs> but I think the one thing that I would, because I'm, I'm actually thinking about what I would say to my nephew and my niece once mm -hmm. they get old enough mm -hmm. to actually maybe even listen to their uncle. I, I think the most important thing is to learn how to become yourself mm. because it is insanely harder than you think it is. Mm. And what I mean by that is you have to learn who you are versus how you were raised mm. versus what your job is versus who your friends are versus the things you identify with, what TV shows, what music, what media you're consuming, what political party you belong to, those are all things, but they're not who you are. Yeah. You are the person who is consuming things from a constellation of choices. Yeah. And so if, to put it in perspective, if you have friends and all of you watch the exact same TV shows and listen to the exact same music and work the exact same jobs and have the exact same friends and you're the only friends that each other have mm -hmm. you're in a cult mm. Mm. right that's fine you could totally subsume your your concept of self in a cult that's what cults are for right but that also doesn't mean that you exist you are now just a cult member hmm. but if you yourself don't like a tv show that the rest of your friends like be okay with that Mm. Learn to be okay with that. Learn to accept that there's something different about you than your friends yeah. and dwell in that, live with that. That's super important yeah. because again, 
we're not going to get like our species is not going to get where we need to get or even get through what we need to get through if all of us are the same. Sure. I mean, I used to think that I was just plain too different, too weird to ever fit in. Mm. Then I met some other weirdos who were weird in their own special ways. And it, I didn't have to change myself as much to be weird with them in their own weird ways. We definitely didn't connect because sure. we didn't have, we didn't until we found things that were semi similar. Sure. So we found the things that we liked that we could all get along with. Yeah. And those, I mean, one of them became, and it still is one of my best friends and like my brother from another mother, I take a bullet for my, uh, for my two buddies, um, who I was in a band with for years. Mm. I met them when I was just starting to figure out that it's okay to be kind of unable to fit in into groups. <laughs> So, Thetis, where can people find out more about you? Like, we talked about your books. Do you write or do you inhabit some other corner of social media? Or uh, Well, that's tricky. Um, so, oh, um, I used to be on Facebook. I used to be on Twitter. I used to, used to, used to. Um, I don't really do social media anymore. <laughs> um, I okay. found it more mentally exhausting than personally fulfilling. I tend to write on Medium a bunch. Okay. Probably will be more write, writing more to Medium this coming year than um, I have in the past. I mean, honestly, if people want to get in touch with me, if people ever want to ask questions or just chat, um, the best way to do it is through my email address, which is uh, just okay. um, which I'll you know it's phages.c at gmail.com, but we'll we'll put the okay. link in the show notes, I guess. Yeah, and uh, other than that. I mean, I have a business site, which is hersinus.com, uh, but that's more or less just where I put the links to Brushfire and Flywheel and uh, where I kind of leave sort of like an open book for people to come and say, hey, I'd like to hire you to work on my company to solve this problem for me. But yeah. that's basically it. Well, thank you, Thijas, for making time. I really appreciate you making the time and space to chat today. Oh, absolutely. It was an absolute pleasure, Skipper, and thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for listening to How This Works. This episode was edited and mastered by Troy Lococo. Please find our show in your favorite podcast app and subscribe. While you're there, it would be great if you could leave us a review. And if I could ask one more thing, tell just one other person about the show and why they should listen. You can find How This Works at howthisworks.show. It's three words, no dashes. Again, that's howthisworks.show. We're also in the places where social media happens. I hope that you got as much out of my chat with Aegis as we had in making it. And we'll talk again soon. I was going to read it and then I realized people, I don't think tune into the show to listen to me talk. They <laughs> listen to the person that I'm talking to. So I had this okay. aha moment where I thought, no, Thesis should just read it because okay, he wrote it. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll get started. Um,